Hi, I'm Jeremy, the Zoo Nerd, coming to you live from my backyard in Los Angeles, California. How's everybody doing today? I hope you're well, I hope you're happy, healthy, having some fun. Today in our Critter Chat, we're going to continue talking about Pollinator Week. Um, obviously, I have not talked about pollinators all week long, just yesterday and today. Um, I've previously done an episode about bees, who are the most important pollinator for humans, and there will be a future episode about a very uh, other important pollinator, bats, um, but that's a lot of information. Um, I might need to split that into multiple episodes, so bats will happen at a future day. Today, we're going to talk about butterflies. Uh, butterflies are incredible animals. They're animals that um, many of us first identify as an insect and learn about when we are little uh, kids. And they're one of the easiest recognizable insects worldwide. With butterflies, it is estimated that there's between 17,000 and 19,000 species of butterflies in the world. Uh, butterflies are still being um, scientifically discovered. Um, every year there's new butterfly species being uh, described. So we're still learning about um, the different types of butterflies and some of them have very, very small uh, home ranges and territories and only live in a very specific climate. So we're still learning a lot about them. In the United States, there's between 700 and 800 species of butterfly. Uh, so although they are uh, very many species globally, there are also many species here where most of us live. Uh, they are found on every continent except Antarctica. Um, pretty much anywhere where there's a plant that has some sort of flower, a butterfly is going to exist. Uh, so that includes deserts, plains, mountains, forests, jungles, islands, wetlands, and cities. Uh, so we have butterflies right here. Um, I often see them behind me in this area of my yard. Uh, so we'll see if we see any butterflies during the Critter Chat today. One of the things that I remember learning about butterflies when I was little, and it still fascinates me, and honestly, many scientists are still kind of puzzled by exactly how it works, is the life cycle of a butterfly. They are one of the prime examples of an animal that undergoes metamorphosis, which is the Latin word for changing shapes uh, during their life. Um, so butterflies' life cycle is pretty complicated. Um, a lot of things we don't fully understand, and it's pretty incredible. Um, as a kid, you may have helped gather little chrysalis or uh, pupa state butterflies, and then watch that slowly emerge and become a butterfly. If not, I recommend that you try to do something like that, even if you're an adult. Uh, it's really fascinating to observe. For starters though, a female butterfly lands on a plant when she knows she needs to lay her egg soon. And she has very special receptors in her feet that taste the plant. And what that does is it helps her know if that plant is a good fit for a food source for her future babies. Um, so she'll taste the plants as she lands on them. And when she finds the right kind, she will lay her eggs on the plant, knowing that they will someday hatch and uh, become juvenile stage butterflies called caterpillars. So she'll lay the eggs on an appropriate host plant is what it's called. And the eggs usually hatch within a couple of days. They're not there too long. Uh, some species it's maybe a couple weeks, but most are pretty quick to hatch. And then once those hatch, they become caterpillars. Uh, at first they're pretty tiny, uh, but caterpillars spend most of their time eating and they usually eat the leaves of the plant. Sometimes they'll eat the, um, the fluids that are in the plant that are delivering the nutrients to the rest of the plant. But they are voracious eaters. And sometimes for people that's viewed as a nuisance. Caterpillars can kind of wipe out certain kinds of plants in some areas pretty quickly because they are so aggressive at eating. During that time frame, they eat almost 24 hours a day and about every day or two, 
they grow so big that they shed their skin to continue growing. And they continue to grow until hormone levels in their little caterpillar body uh, tell them that they've reached enough growth. And then after that last skin sheds, a new type of skin starts to form over them that's a hard casing. And they'll go to a place where they understand that they'll be safe for a little while and that hard casing kind of grows over the top of them and they become a chrysalis or a pupa. Um, these kind of look like little nuts, kind of. They're usually brown, sometimes green, sometimes yellow, um, but they're hard um, on the outside. They usually attach themselves under the edge of a plant or a leaf, um, sometimes on like a fence um, or on a house even. Uh, but they'll find a place that they think is safe. They'll attach to that. They kind of hang vertically and become this hard little like pod. And inside that little pod, some amazing things happen. Uh, each of those little caterpillars has special chemicals and hormones in their body that tell their body it is time to make some big changes. And those chemicals in their body help them to change shape during that time frame. Now this can vary between one week for some species, um, up to two months, that's the average. But there's a handful of species where it can take many months, even years, some species even seven years as a pupa or a chrysalis. And during that time frame, they change from a caterpillar that looks kind of like a worm with lots of little legs into a gorgeous butterfly. Um, and when they start to hatch, they kind of tear open their little chrysalis skin and work their way out. They unfold their big wings and during that next uh, few minutes, their wings fill with a very special fluid and then they start to harden and dry. And once their wings are dry, they're able to fly and then they live a very different life. So as a caterpillar, they eat the leaves or sometimes the the sap or the milk inside the plant. As an adult, they eat something totally different. They actually don't have a mouth like they did when they were a caterpillar. Um, so they can't eat leaves anymore. They have to eat uh, fluids and those fluids are juice or nectar that are inside flowers. Um, and so they spend most of their day flying around from one sort of flower to another flower to another flower. And they have a very special mouth now that's called a proboscis. It's kind of a little ton straw thing that they can unroll and goes into the flower and it helps them to suck up that nectar. Um, they then can fly around, they can migrate, um, they can reproduce pretty quick. Uh, female butterflies, I believe, can reproduce uh, right away. Males take a couple more days until they're ready to reproduce. But soon they are reproducing and the cycle starts all over again with a female finding the right plant to lay her eggs on. Um, it's a pretty quick life cycle. Most butterflies live less than a year. Some butterflies only live a couple months total from when they were an egg to when they die as an adult. A uh, very short lifespan. What's really amazing about that is that some species, quite a few actually, migrate. And that's migration is a huge journey usually, um, sometimes hundreds of miles, sometimes thousands of miles for some species. And with butterflies, because their lifespan so short, some of them only know different phases of the migration and no individual sees the whole thing, um, which is pretty incredible that for the greater good, they all participate in a communal effort to save their species and to live uh, as a species another day. I think that's something humans could probably learn a lot from right now. Um, but with uh, butterfly migration, one of the most notable is a very big, beautiful butterfly that we see here in the United States quite a bit called a monarch butterfly. Monarch butterflies are pretty big. They're um, bright orange with black and white spots. Um, monarch butterflies live throughout most of the United States and into southern Canada during the summer months. But as it starts to get colder, they start to migrate south. 
and they migrate down into Mexico during the winter. And so they uh, go to a very, very specific location in the middle of Mexico, up in the mountains, where they will stay for the winter. And during that time, they're pretty much dormant. So the individuals that make it to Mexico pretty much don't do a whole lot during their time there. And then they'll start their migration back north in the springtime, laying eggs pretty soon. And then the adults die off and then the new ones continue that migration. So different butterflies in the monarch species live at different time frames. So no one individual sees the whole round trip cycle. That area in Mexico is tiny. Um, this past winter season, so from 2019 to 2020, that uh, area was only seven acres in size, uh, which is pretty small. Um, that's kind of the size of a really big parking lot at say like a Costco. That's pretty small area where all the monarch butterflies are wintering. Um, between 2018 to 2019, that cut more than half in size. So it was about 15 acres from 2018 to 2019 winter, and from 2019 to 2020 winter, it was only about seven acres. So uh, monarch butterflies are definitely decreasing quite a bit. Now, when they're there, they're like right next to each other in all these trees. So there's still hundreds of thousands of individuals, maybe even millions, um, but it is significant, the decrease that they've seen. With monarch butterflies, their biggest uh, threat that they're seeing is that their host plant, the plant that the female lays its eggs on, is a certain type of weed called a milkweed. And milkweeds are kind of, they don't serve any real big purpose for people. So a lot of times if you see a milkweed, you pull it out, you throw it away, you put it in your compost, you get rid of it. And throughout the United States, a lot of milkweed has disappeared. There's a lot less host plants for monarchs to lay their eggs on. Therefore, there's a lot less butterflies making that full life cycle and growing and becoming adults and then migrating. Many other butterflies migrate as well. I remember a couple years ago here in LA, we had a painted lady butterfly migration that came through that was really incredible. They were on their way from Southern California up to Oregon. Uh, typically, they migrate a little further east of here, kind of out in the desert areas. Um, but this time they came further west and uh, near the coast through LA and up to uh, southern Oregon. But it was really cool to see them because it was hundreds of butterflies uh, all around you at uh, the time frame for their migration, which in LA was about a week to 10 day span um, of butterflies all the time. It was really cool to see that. Butterflies are super dependent upon color. Color is very important to them. Um, the colors that scientists think they see the best are reds, yellows, and greens. Um, but butterflies have highly developed eyes. Their eyes have over 6,000 lenses. And with those eyes, they can see things into the ultraviolet spectrum of light. And that's a place that our eyes can't really see. So it's believed the butterflies actually can see colors that we don't even know exist. Um, that they're able to see different hues and shapes and metallic versions of colors that our eyes just don't pick up on. Um, colors are very important for them to find members of their own species. Sometimes males and females have different color patterns or different colors altogether. Um, but it also helps them to find their food. Uh, adult butterflies only eat nectar um, from flowers, so they use their straw-like tongue to get that. Um, they l typically land on flowers that are in bunches, so lots of flowers that grow really close together and a good place for them to land. Um, that's very important because like hummingbirds that we talked about yesterday, they don't typically land when they're feeding. They need a flower that they can access really quickly while hovering in the air, whereas butterflies typically land and then extend their tongue into the flower to drink the nectar. During that process, they perform what is called pollination because some pollen from the flower they're feeding on gets on their wings, gets on their body, 
and then they take that to the next flower they feed on and that helps the plants be able to reproduce. So they are an important pollinator for many species of flowers um, that we like to uh, look at. Uh, they don't particularly pollinate a ton of food things that we like bees do or like some other species do, um, but they are still a very important pollinator in the plant kingdom. With the butterflies in the United States, between 700 and 800 species of butterflies, about 17% of them are threatened with being endangered. Um, two big threats for butterflies that are out there. First is habitat loss. We talked about this a little bit with, my, uh, with the monarch butterflies uh, losing their milkweed. They're very important. One plant that they rely on for food as caterpillars is disappearing. Um, in other places where we cut down the forest or we turn the land into agricultural land, um, we sometimes take away the plants that they need because we just think they're weeds. But it may be, in fact, a very important plant for that butterfly. The other super big threat for butterflies are pesticides and poisons. Um, this can be something that you're spraying around your house or your yard to get rid of like ants or other bugs or maybe spiders or roaches or who knows what that can kill the butterflies as well. Also things you might be spraying to kill weeds, maybe uh, getting into the butterfly system and killing them as well. So poisons in general are very bad for the big world picture of life. Uh, usually poisons affect way more species than the one you're trying to get rid of. Uh, so that can happen. We've talked about it with other mammals. If you're trying to get rid of rats or mice or something, it can affect owls. It can affect um, all sorts of other uh, predator species. The same is true if you poison plants. If you're poisoning weeds or grass or something that's in your driveway, it's easier to, or it's not easier, it's more environmentally friendly to try to dig that out and pull it out get rid of it that way rather than poisoning it because it can have big negative effects on the insects and other animals that rely on those plants i wanted to talk a little bit about some of my experiences um, with butterflies i've never been a zookeeper that specifically worked with butterflies but during my employment at the zoo in la I was able to significantly help out with a very important butterfly conservation project. And this wasn't anything that the zoo was doing, but we still helped out in a very important way. So in 1976, the, there is a very little butterfly that has a very small home range um, here in Los Angeles called the El Segundo Blue Butterfly. And it specifically lives on really near the coast of the ocean in a very small area. Um, and its main plant that is very important to it is called the coastal buckwheat. And it is so tied to this plant. That's where it lays its eggs. That's what the caterpillars eat. But it's also what the adults eat. The adults eat the nectar from the coastal buckwheat flowers, which kind of looks like a grass flower or like a wheat. Um, it's super important to them and it grows in only a very small area of the coastal dunes, like the little sand hills where the weeds and plants start to grow beyond the ocean. That's the area where they live. Now here in Los Angeles, that's also a place a lot of people wanted to be. And in 1976, some scientists that were studying butterflies in LA realized that this butterfly species was in serious danger. That year, they only counted 50, five zero, of that butterfly species. Um, they were able to get it listed on the Endangered Species Act, and it was actually the first insect to ever be listed on the Endangered Species Act. And with that, they were able to set aside a little chunk of land to be a sanctuary for that species. That little chunk of land was only 20 acres, so a really small area um, in the little uh, town of El Segundo, which is right on the coast of the Pacific Ocean, right near LAX, the big airport here in Los Angeles. Well, as time went on, there was also a big neighborhood that had been built just north of where that little sanctuary was. 
And that neighborhood was built right at the edge of where LAX, the airport, kind of met up near the ocean. So there was all these houses that lived in between the airport and the ocean. They had a great view of the ocean, but it actually became a safety hazard for the people living there to be so close to the airplanes that were taking off. So the government decided that those people needed to move and those houses all got torn down. And in that process, they thought, well, what do we use this land for? And the government actually made a very good decision and said, let this be a little wildlife sanctuary. So nestled right between one of the busiest airports in the world and the beach is a now 300 acre wildlife sanctuary. And that is the home range of the El Segundo blue butterfly. Um, at their last count, they found over 90,000 of these butterflies living in this space. So it's proven that it's worked and there's still work going on today. During my first uh, job at the LA Zoo, I worked in the commissary department. That meant I helped prepare the food for the animals at the zoo. One of the food sources that the animals like to eat, especially things like giraffes, and um, Garnook that we talked about earlier this week, and several of the other species of antelope, deer, um, some of the great apes, uh, some tapers, they all eat, like to eat branches off of trees. And in this El Segundo uh, habitat area near LAX, there was a plant that had grown in there uh, since the neighborhood had gone away and before it got turned into a conservation area, that was called acacia. Acacia is a plant that is typically not found in the United States. Um, and the species of acacia that was growing there is something that was very delicious to a lot of zoo animals. And so as my job as part of the commissary, I would help find branches the animals could eat. One of the places that had a lot of those branches was this conservation area near LAX. And so once a week, I would drive the big zoo truck down near LAX to collect branches that we would take back and feed to the zoo animals. And we worked with the conservation people and the landscape crew from the airport to cut down these invasive trees that were there at the uh, conservation area and feed them out to the zoo animals. So it was a kind of um, easy way for the zoo benefited because we got food for the animals. The conservation area benefited because they could clear the land to put more of the coastal buckwheat there and the butterflies who live there and need that area benefited because now they had more of the plant they needed and less of the plant they did not. Um, so that was um, a huge uh, part of my job during my early days at the LA Zoo. And I'm glad that I was able to help out in such a meaningful way where everyone involved benefited. If you want to help out with butterflies, I'll be posting some tips up on the Facebook page later today of plants you can plant in your garden um, or in your yard that can help uh, attract butterflies, feed butterflies, and help butterflies continue to thrive. In addition to limiting your use of pesticides and uh, weed poisons, all those things can help out as well. I hope you've enjoyed what I've shared with you today about butterflies. I'll be posting more information on the Facebook profile later today. And as always, feel free to like, share, follow, and subscribe to any of my content across uh, the different platforms, uh, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and on my website at jeremythezoonerd.com. I'll be taking tomorrow off from Critter Chat, uh, so I will see you all again on Monday. Until then, be happy. Be healthy. Have fun. Be safe. Bye.